My earring fell out and my nail polish was chipped. Let's get started. Hi, hello, how are you? Welcome back to my channel. I hope you're doing well because I know that I am because I'm doing something really exciting today. For those of you who don't know, I currently am a senior at Stanford where I study product design, but Stanford being the liberal arts school that it is gives me the opportunity to take classes in whatever program that I want to. So in all of my free time, I've shoved myself into literature classes. And now that I'm coming into my final year, I've realized I've read quite a bit at college and so I wanted to reflect on the things that they've made me read. I'm going to be ranking them all for you today. So here are my tiers. At the very top, we have Chef's Kiss. These are books that I read for school, but would have loved to have read in my own time. I recommend them. They're like right up there for me and my favorites. Then we have Intellectually Stimulating, which means like it was fun to read for class. I feel like I got something out of it. It was a valuable reading experience, but it wasn't like super duper fun. Then we have Oops, I forgot the plot. So these are books that were just forgettable. Like I didn't feel like they pushed me or challenged me in a way that was lasting or meaningful. And then we have Ye old Books Are Dumb. So like a little frustrating to read. And then at the bottom we have Literal Piece of Propaganda. So without any further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna try and do this chronologically. No promises, not a single one. Um, so these are all out of order. I uploaded them in order, but you know, considering I'm a tech person, I should have done better than this. So we'll start with, I guess in my freshman year at Stanford, everyone's required to take what's called a thinking matters class, which is a class that's outside of the discipline that you want to study that forces you to develop critical thinking skills and basic writing skills and also helps you meet other freshmen. And the one that I took was called evil. It was like a philosophy survey course where we went through like different periods of modern philosophy and examined them from the perspective of the problem of evil, which is if there's an omnibenevolent, all kind and omnipotent, all powerful God, how is there evil in this world? And so looking through the perspective of different philosophical thinkers. And so for that, I have just like Leviathan because that's one of the texts that they had us read an excerpt from. And I'm gonna put this in intellectually stimulating because at the time I was so frustrated. I was like, they're telling us what to think because they were very much like, this is what Hobbes thought. This is what Milton is saying. And I was like, how dare you? I thought the whole point was to develop critical thinking skills. And then I realized that like, the point of it was to give us a wide range of understandings of different ways of thinking about the same problem so that by the end of the quarter, we had the tools to then do the critical thinking and decide, oh, this in conversation with this means that this is possible. And being able to do that critical thinking and analysis afterwards was more the point rather than sitting in section and arguing with our section leader, which obviously I would never do. So during the quarter, I definitely was like, I hate this. And then that's a problem at college is you get there and you're like, I'm so smart. And everyone else thinks they're so smart. I found that it took me a while to be like, hey, I'm here because I don't know these things yet. So maybe I should listen and try and learn. So that class has definitely grown on me as I come to reflect on it, especially since the things that we learned in that class carried over into the other literature and philosophy classes that I took. And even if it had been the only lit class that I took at Stanford, I still think I would have gotten a ton out of it. So that quarter, I also took the first class into two class series, which is a survey of Russian literature. So the first thing that we read for that class was Eugene Onegin, which I'm going to put in Chef's Kiss. This is by Alexander Pushkin. It's his novel in verse. It's the first real piece of standout Russian literature where Pushkin was doing something that was incredibly innovative by writing this novel in verse. So the whole thing is a poem and the translation is absolutely amazing. There's an audiobook of it. It's like absolutely stunning to listen to because of the meter and the way that it flows. The story is captivating. The execution was incredible. And it was what really solidified my love for Russian literature. I'd read Anna Karenina in high school and I thought that I was edgy when I said that it was my favorite book. Um, so I wanted to read more Russian literature and this was kind of like what set it in stone for me. I was like, I don't just like reading Tolstoy because it sounds nice to say that I've read it. This is actually something that really actually spoke to me. Then the next thing that we read in that class was more Pushkin. We read The Captain's Daughter and other stories. So we read the stories of Belkin, The Captain's Daughter, and one more, I believe, but it has escaped me. And I hate to do it, but I'm gonna say, oops, I forgot the plot 
because I was so impressed by Pushkin, by uh, Eugene Onegin, and then to read his like long form prose, it just didn't impress me as much, especially since we followed it directly after with A Hero of Our Time by Mikhail Lermontov, which is just such a wonderful satire of the Byronic hero and plays with Russian culture and felt like it was so much more daring in what it was trying to do. And the execution prose-wise I think was much stronger than what Pushkin put forward. And so I was much more captivated by that. So I'm gonna put Lermontov in intellectually stimulating and Pushkin's just gonna have to stay in, oops, I forgot the plot. Then the last thing that we read in that class was a selection of short stories by Nikolai Gogol. So we read The Overcoat, The Nose, and Diary of a Madman, and all three of these stories, top tier, god tier, chef's kiss. When I say that Nikolai Gogol is just, he is a mastermind. He is so sarcastic and funny, and the way that he's mocking Russian culture while also examining it, and the way that he weaves in absurdity. It's so beautifully executed. It's so refreshing as well, like for the, for the time when it was published. Absolutely incredible, stunning. If you only read one, read Diary of a Madman. Could not suggest it highly enough, like even if you're not interested in the classics at all. The language is super accessible. The plot is absolutely hysterical. And even if you're not reading it for any kind of like literary analysis, you can read it as just like a plain satire and it'll still be awesome. So love Gagal, loved this class, and I'm so glad that I took it my freshman year. This was like my first quarter freshman year and it was such an amazing experience. I was about to move on and because these aren't in order, I forgot a book and that's from the philosophy, like that's from the philosophy class. One of the full texts that we had to read, because usually we were just reading small excerpts from the text, but one of the full books that we had to read was called Strangers Drowning and it was part of this series of um, readings that we did about how like empathy is like going to be our downfall. I remember reading it and I was like, this is a literal piece of propaganda. Like I, there's no value in reading this. Cause the other things that we were reading, I was like, yes, it is good for me to read these like core, like staples of philosophical thinking because they're helping me develop a good base for me to be able to read more things, understand more like literary references and be able to think more critically about the classics that I read without just reading on a surface level for plot. Like I felt like I was getting so much value out of that. And then to read this felt like such a slap in the face. I was bored, I hated it, and I don't feel like I learned anything. Right in the bottom, right in the bottom. That's all that I read my freshman year. And then my sophomore year, I took the second class in the Russian literature series. So the first thing that we read for that was Crime and Punishment. And this goes right back up there in Chef's Kiss. I loved this. I thought that the questions it was asking were explored so well. Dostoevsky is really the master of using multiple perspectives to really dissect problems and he masks himself in his narrative in a way that is so compelling. He's writing to explore questions and he as the author kind of disappears and it's so masterfully done. It's something that he's really well known for and this was my first time being exposed to it and I was just so in awe of it from like a craft perspective, from the way that it made me think. The plot was so interesting, the characters were gripping, and even if I just read it for fun, I think I still would have had an amazing time. So like, chef's kiss, recommend this to everybody. It's one of my favorite classics. Love, 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 love. Then we read another Dostoevsky. We read The Brothers Karamazov, and I'm gonna put this in intellectually stimulating because I just didn't like it as much as Crime and Punishment. And that's on me, because I was like, oh, another Dostoevsky, I love him so much, he is my favorite. And then it wasn't Crime and Punishment. And me being petty, I was like, it's not as good. So like, on me for being petty and closed-minded, but I still really enjoyed it. I think the way that he's incorporating, like, and the same thing where he's inc incorporating philosophical ideas is like, it's just so masterfully done that it's still, it really still is a masterpiece of literature. I just can't put it on the same tier as Crime and Punishment. Then we read Oblomov, which was sold to us as like a classic of the same standing of like a Christmas Carol in like Western culture where everyone knows what it means to be a Scrooge. And that in Russia, everybody knows what it means to be an Oblomov, which is someone who's like super lazy and doesn't really want to do anything. They're an Oblomov. And so I was like, this is going to be awesome. There's this lazy guy. And then turns out when you're reading about a lazy guy, he doesn't really do that much. 
And I, like, coming off the high of Dostoevsky, it was just a little disappointing to me. And really, I don't remember anything from the experience, so there we go. I, like, hate to say it, but I kind of forgot the plot. Um, and then the last book that we read in the Russian literature class was War and Peace, the absolute behemoth. I was so, so afraid of this book and it really felt like a rite of passage for me to sit down every day in my dorm and tackle 50 pages of this book and annotating it and living with these characters for so long. It was absolutely stunning. I loved the experience and it was really a, it was a formative intellectual experience for me. And it's the kind of thing where I'm so glad that I read it. Absolutely loved it. And the paper that I ended up writing for this book is one of my proudest achievements. The research that I did for this, it really pushed me so far out of my comfort zone and made me feel so accomplished. Absolutely loved reading War and Peace. Ooh, all the way up in chef's kiss. And after the Russian literature class for my spring quarter in my sophomore year, I took a class all about Albert Camus and it was taught in French, so we were reading the text in French and I'd read The Stranger in English, but it was such a like valuable experience to be able to read it in French. For those of you who don't know, I went to high school in Paris and the kids that were in the French native language class had to study l'étranger when they were in high school and I remember one of my best friends telling me about how different it was having read it in French and English and the like way that they were able to discuss issues of translation and racism and the way that it was published and all of these really interesting questions about the politics of Camus writing was like so interesting to me in high school and then being able to actually partake in that discussion myself in college was so gratifying and so exciting for me. Being able to read L'étranger in French was a huge moment for me, but it isn't my favorite work by Camus, so I'm going to put it in intellectually stimulating. <sighs> then we read uh, Le Mythe de Sisyphe, so the myth of Sisyphus, to give us like a more base understanding of Camus' idea of absurdity and like the general philosophies that like are the cornerstone of his writing. Liked it, it's a short story, it didn't really make that much of an impression on me, it was useful for the analysis of the rest of his texts, but other than that, I put it in intellectually stimulating because it was an important read, but like wasn't my favorite. Then we read L'Homme Révolté or The Rebel, which examines his ideas of rebelling against the absurd, which I was much more interested in because this idea of rebelling against the absurd is something that appears a lot in The Brothers Karamazov, which I had just read. So like two months ago, I'd been seeing these ideas in print and I hadn't really grasped them fully, but I felt like there was something there and then being able to read an explanation of it and then finding out that Dostoevsky was like actually riffing off of Camus was huge for me. So reading that was like absolutely crazy and like a big intellectual moment for me where I was like putting texts in conversation with each other by myself for the first time. So I like really loved reading that. And then the last thing by Camus that we read was La Peste or the plague and we this was like march 2020 so like prime time to be reading about a plague and it was definitely like an uncanny valley situation like reading about a city that goes into lockdown and the way that people change and these ideas of absurdity and seeing camus philosophies through this lens of the plague while we were also going through like a very parallel experience was so trippy and even though we're like at the end of quarantine now if you haven't read la peste if you haven't read the plague i would still highly recommend that you do because it's such a grounding experience so i loved that i'm gonna put it in intellectually stimulating though because if i hadn't read it during these covid times i don't think it would have had as much of an impact i think a lot of it was like me like self-inserting so it wasn't like god tier it isn't the kind of thing that i would be able to revis revisit over and over and over again and always love so intellectually stimulating it is then we'll meander on into the creative writing classes that i took i've taken a handful of creative writing classes i've always liked writing when i was a kid the first fortune cookie i ever got when i was like two or three years old said you're gonna be a writer when you grow up and it's one of my first memories and it really stuck with me and i truly believed it i wrote my own book when i was seven years old it was 10 pages long i thought i was a literary queen so when i got to college i was like i would love to learn more about the craft and so I enrolled in a couple creative writing classes and these are some of the books that we read in them. So for one of them, we read quite a few short stories. We read some short stories by Sally Rooney that have appeared in The New Yorker. And I'm gonna say, oops, I forgot the plot because ugh, I just remember that it was like sad young people in Ireland. 
and that's it. And there were fireworks in one of the stories. So it really didn't speak to me then. I remember being like, Sally Rooney? She wrote this? So I was not super impressed by her short story work. And I think that's because what she does so well are these like elongated character studies and, and in a short story format, I think her character work was compelling, but in 10 pages, there's only so much you can do. And I just didn't connect with it to the extent that like, I really can't remember what happened. Then we read Stories of Your Life and Other Collected Stories by Ted Chang. So if you've seen the movie Arrival, the short story that that's based off of is in this anthology. That short story is excellent. I really enjoyed it. I also really liked the short story. There's one short story about the Tower of Babylon that really like bent my mind. Like afterwards, I like called one of my friends and like they came down and we were like drawing out like sketches of like how the universe is configured in this story and like trying to figure it out. Like it was like such a trippy experience and I totally loved it. I'm also a sucker for speculative fiction. I love sci-fi and fantasy. So having some of that sprinkled into my English curriculum, loved that for me. So I'm gonna put that in intellectually stimulating. These weren't like any of my favorites, but like definitely appreciated them. Then the creative writing department at Stanford is mostly staffed by ex Stegner fellows. So basically they have this fellowship where they bring in 20 writers like for a rotation of, I think it's like two years. And they're like the most talented up and coming writers from around the country. And they have a fellowship for two years. And then afterwards they can either go off and become real authors or they can stay at Stanford and teach creative writing classes. And one of the professors who stayed and taught creative writing classes published a book. Her name is Ruchika Tomar, and the book is called A Prayer for Travelers. And another one of my ex Stegner fellow professors had us read it as a required reading. And boy, did I hate it. I was like, we're in a class that's supposed to teach us about the craft of writing, and this book is so clumsily put together. Like, I was so frustrated reading this because basically it follows this plot of like trauma and abuse and trying to solve this mystery. And so while trying to solve this mystery in the A plot, the B plot is revealed to you sporadically and out of order because the logical thinking behind it is when you're like, when you're going through trauma, you don't remember things linearly. Things come back to you, things are blocked out of your memory and everything's disorienting. So she wanted to recreate that in the novel. The effects of this are that because none of the characters are that compelling, the setting is very one dimensional and the things that happen are like pretty routine. It's absolutely impossible to know where you are in the narrative basically the whole time. And from a craft perspective, it just made me so angry because there are really amazing examples of books that are written like out of order. And this just felt so clumsily done. I felt the author's hand so heavily. The fact that that was given to us as an example of like superb novel writing was so frustrating to me. Like you just gave it this to us so that she had 30 guaranteed sales of her book. Like literal piece of propaganda absolutely was not for me. Then for a different class, we read Exit West by Moshin Hamid. This is interesting. It basically explores an alternate reality in which refugees are able to escape from where they live through these magical doors that open into the first world. Its purpose is humanizing refugees and like examining the humanity of them. And from that perspective, I was like, excellent, great job. Definitely a story that needs to be told, an incredibly compelling perspective. However, this idea of these doors that are able to bridge the gap, I felt like there were so many ramifications of that that needed to be explored that weren't. Like the international response to these doors, they were like, like it was mentioned like, oh wow, governments are gonna have to get involved in this and then nothing ever happened with it. And I felt like the world, if you're going to be talking about the like ramifications of refugees being able to move around, actually explore that. And it felt like it was much more of a character study of these refugees leaving their countries but then the trauma of leaving the country because it is just stepping through a door is greatly diminished. So there were some like things where I felt like I was almost there. I just had to suspend my disbelief a tiny bit more and I wasn't able to. So that was like a bit of a bummer for me. I wanted to love this, but there were just a couple things from a craft perspective, considering we were in a writing craft class that I just couldn't get past. 
So for that, I'm gonna put it in ye old books are dumb, even though this isn't a dumb book, because I wasn't just neutral on it. Even when I did read it, I was a little bit frustrated with it. Ooh, another short story that we read was Haruki Murakami's The Iceman. So this follows basically like a man who's made of ice, who's from the South Pole, and he goes and lives in Japan, and he falls in love with this normal woman, and then he like gets so homesick that he has to go back to the South Pole and she decides to go with him. And you're put in this mystical, mythical, dreamlike state as you are in all of Murakami's works. And so I enjoyed this. It was like a quick 10 pages and like made me think. Um, it was cute, intellectually stimulating, but voila. And then the last book that I read for a creative writing class was Passing by Nella Larson. And this is like a teeny tiny little book. It's about the African-American community, specifically people who are white passing. So whose skin is light enough that in larger society, they can pass as white. It's set in the 20s. So when segregation is still absolutely rampant and the racism in this book is incredibly vile and it follows two women who are both white passing, one of whom has decided to integrate herself fully into white culture and pretend to be white. The other one does not. And then reuniting after many, many years apart and seeing each other's lives in the way that the choices that they didn't make could have played out if they decided to live differently. And so this was not just like a fun, interesting text, but it was something that changed my perspective on the world and my relationship with myself. So this was an incredibly fundamental text and I'm so glad that they had me read this. Then, as you will know, if you watched my hyped books, I hated video. I took a class on John Milton's Paradise Lost last year and basically for 10 weeks we did a close reading on the poem and I loved this class and I love Milton. I think his writing style is so beautiful. The questions that he's asking are so demanding, the way that he's interacting with British culture at the time when he's writing this and the political implications of his words and the fact that he was blind when he wrote this and he dictated it. The whole thing was such a masterclass in writing and storytelling and so I absolutely love this and I thought it was fantastic. Chef's Kiss to Paradise Lost. So the last class that I took was a survey of the great Victorian novel. So we started with Dickens and went all the way to Thomas Hardy. So the first book that we read was Oliver Twist, which I expected to be like fun and lighthearted. I was like, oh, no big deal. It's like a little kid running around London, right? Wrong, 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 wrong. It's so gory and a lot more violent than I expected it to be. So I was like a little thrown off. Dickens and I historically have not the best relationship. I'm not his biggest fan. And so I'm gonna put this in, oops, I forgot the plot. I didn't really care for it. I think there was a lot of shock value for me where I was like, I did not know that this was the plot of Oliver Twist. Cause I only knew the like, ooh, can I have a one please reference. Um, and I like had no idea what other like grim stuff happens in this book. So there was some like shock for me. And so I was interested in reading, like while I was reading, I was interested cause I was just so shocked, but other than that, I was like not that into it. Next, we read Jane Eyre, and this was my first time reading Jane Eyre. I'd read Wuthering Heights in the past, and I really loved it, so I was like, Jane Eyre is going to be great. And coming off of Oliver Twist, I was like, oh, finally, something interesting. So I liked Jane Eyre. I didn't love it. I don't think I liked it as much as Wuthering Heights. The ending, we like battled it out in class, and I like was very fiercely on the I did not love this ending side of things. Um, but like this text in particular, the editor from the Oxford Classics came and spoke to our class because she did her master's degree with my English professor. And so they were friends. So she came and talked to us about what it was like to edit the new edition of Jane Eyre. And so from that perspective, like it was really interesting to be able to get a behind the scenes look and like the class definitely made the book for me, but on its own, I was like, this is medium. This is like aggressively medium. I'm also going to put it in, oops, I forgot the plot because without the class and the value that the class added, I don't think this book would have really done it for me. Then, then we have Adam Bede by George Eliot. She's best known for Middlemarch, but I'm really glad that we read Adam Bede because I loved this book. The questions that it was asking of me were really demanding and I felt so pushed by it and so compelled by the story that I absolutely loved reading it and it's the kind of thing that I can see myself picking up again to revisit. So I'm gonna put this in Chef's Kiss. 
And the last book that we read was Tess of the D'Urbervilles, As Dark As It Did, which I think is like the larger theme for all of the Victorian novels where I was like, oh, this is, this is a lot. Wasn't expecting you to go there, but it was fun. I would say like, once again, pretty medium, like not a favorite of mine, but like I didn't hate it. I was just taken a little off guard. By that time, the shock value of like the Victorian novel being gory had worn off a little bit. So I'm gonna put this one probably in Oops, I Forgot the Plot because I probably won't forget the plot because it's like quite jarring. Same for like the rest of the Victorian novels, but like, I don't think that I'll ever pick these up again. So there we go. Those are all of the books that I read at college. Looking at them now, it's kind of crazy to see how much I've read for school, considering that I'm not like a literature major. I just take these classes for fun because I think the classics can be really intimidating, but being able to sit in a classroom filled with students whose like absolute passion it is to be talking about these books and learning from them and also learning from like incredible professors who are at like the height of their field is such an honor and a privilege. And so I'm so glad that I've been milking this opportunity. Hear smart people talk about the things that they're passionate about. And yeah, I feel pretty good about this ranking. I feel like this sums up my taste pretty well. As always, it was an absolute pleasure having you here. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like and subscribe. Let me know down below what your favorite book that you've had to read for school is and also what your least favorite was. What's a book that they made you read that you absolutely hated? I'd love to know. And with that, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys next time.